Are you ready to rewind? Take a nostalgia filled ride back to a simpler time. It's Acid Wash Memories, a retro pop culture celebration. And now, your hosts, Joe Morata and Michael Quinn. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number eight of Acid Wash Memories, a retro pop culture celebration. Today, we're talking about the one and only Mr. Rogers. We hope it's a beautiful day in your neighborhood. I'm Joe Morata, and straight from the land of make believe is Michael Quinn. How you doing there, Michael? Hi, that's me, Mr. Make Believe. Yes, hi neighbor. Hi, I guess we should say. hi neighbor. Yes, hi neighbor. We thank put you. my shoes on. Yes, put your Sneakers, shoes on. Not the dress shoes. Get in your cardigan, folks. Get ready here because we're going to celebrate uh, the life and career of Fred Rogers. We sure thank you for being with us here. We hope you're doing well. If you haven't checked us out before, we got episodes in the archives, and you can follow us on Twitter at a w m podcast on Twitter. You can also join our Facebook discussion group. We talk about all sorts of retro pop culture topics. Whatever seems to uh, float our boat at the time. Whatever seems to tickle our fancy. If it's old, if it's pop culture, it's probably there. It's probably there. This, uh, this episode here, episode number eight, you know, it's been now 20 years since the world lost Fred Rogers, Mr. Wow, Rogers. Already. 20 Feels years. Feels like it was just yesterday. I know. The patron saint of children's television died early Thursday at his home in Pittsburgh. Good. And Mr. Rogers, before we get into it here, I just want to say I watched him growing up. And what I like about Mr. Rogers is the show was on for so long that a lot of generations of kids watched him. Yeah. When my parents introduced it to me, they were like, he was on, you know, when we were young or whatever. I don't know, like, exactly when he premiered, the late 60s. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, my parents were of age to watch it. Exactly. And I think a lot of you out there, even if you didn't maybe watch it all the time, Mm -hmm. you know who Mr. Rogers is. Yep. You're familiar with the concept of the show. I feel like, let me say this, is I feel like Mr. Rogers is not a watch every episode kind of no, show. No, no, no. It's, it's not a binge watch type of it's thing. It's not that's not even how kids consumed it. It was kind of like it's on. It's on like, and it's you just, watch it. It's on and the TV just happens to be on in the middle of the day. Correct. I'm very happy we're still neighbors. And might I add, I'm still very proud of you. Tune in weekday mornings at eight. We just hope that Today, we can celebrate the life of the man and the show itself. And we're going to also compare it to some other PBS, you know, programming oh, yeah, the that PBS was on. Beauties. Around, yeah, the PBS beauties that were on around the same time. But Mr. Rogers really, in, in my mind, brings a lot of comfort. Yes. He was very earnest. He was a very good hearted man, I think, that, uh, that really did make a real effort to help kids, help children, and mm-hmm. even, you know, in this day and age, help adults deal with feelings and situations. Well, I think and- he, he set the table for. I guess not what's right and wrong, but a proper way to act in public. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it, it, there's like act. a, you know, treat others nicely and that kind of thing, you know? Right. And he didn't shy away from confronting difficult issues that kids might experience and feelings that kids might yeah. experience. So many people have asked me, do you ever get mad? And of course I answer, well, yes, everyone gets mad sometimes. The important thing is what we do with the mad that we feel in life. I've heard it said before, and I agree with this sentiment, that Mr. Rogers, what he brought to the table for kids programming was he didn't talk down to kids. Yep. He talked to them like he was their friend. Yep. That wasn't really what children's television was before that. No, it wasn't, Quinn. And (laughs) that's actually great that you mentioned that because we are going to talk a little bit about what was going on in children's television. And and to be fair, television was newish. Yeah. When Mr. Rogers came along, but nobody had set the like tone of like, hey, maybe you shouldn't be like, <laughs> kids, like, you know, like maybe you should be like, hey, I know what you're, what's going on and right. let's I know learn about this feel. today. Yeah. yeah. Like, and that is what Fred did. Uh, Mr. Ro- I can't even call him Fred. Mr. Rogers right. to me. Who called him Fred? That's, Only, that's like disrespectful. Yeah, it is. Like, right? Who does that? I think even adults should call him Mr. Rogers. And folks, obviously, as we go on here, we're going to encourage you to uh, tweet at us at AWM Podcast or join our group and post your memories, your thoughts about Mr. Rogers, maybe watching it growing up. And obviously, it was uh, all the reruns were always on also. It wasn't mm-hmm. like they were always new yeah. episodes. No, as a kid, you don't know that. I, didn't, I, I had no, no clue if an episode was from 1975 right. or 1987. Yeah. Like, I had no idea. <laughs> exactly. So that's what we're going to get into here. But overall, yeah, I think that he he was just a decent, earnest, real kind person mm-hmm. uh, by all accounts that really did care about helping children and helping people. But how did this all start? Well, Fred Rogers was born in 1928. 
Wow. March 20th to be exact, uh, near Pittsburgh in a town called Latrobe, Pennsylvania, which some of you might know uh, is where Rolling Rock used to be brewed. That, that name sounded familiar the, the minute you said it, because didn't it used to be on the bottle? Yeah. Yeah. Rolling Rock, uh, which is actually a pretty decent, like, easily drinkable beer, Oh, for yeah. the record, right? Rolling Rock, same as it ever was. Uh, and Fred uh, got a bachelor's in music, and then he went to the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and he was actually ordained. Some people don't realize this. He was an ordained Presbyterian minister. Right. He believed that his ministry was not to preach, you know, from a mm-hmm. pulpit, so to speak, but was to... Educate kids, teach kids through the way of television. He had a passion for teaching kids. He did. Just like I'm sure there's many teachers out there to this day who I, just, you know, they, they got involved in the schools because they wanted to teach. Right. And that's right? actually their passion. It's something yeah. they really live for. Uh, and meanwhile, he happened to become a floor director of some television shows at NBC. NBC Television. <laughs> We set the stage here. Like, you're, the, what year is this? He became a floor director at NBC in the early fifties, right? So this isn't NBC. Oh, ah, this is. We're just trying to get the TV running here. <laughs> right. Like, we're just trying to get enough content. Out. <laughs> like, it's not some glamorous true, fucking thing. It's like they were just they were just getting anybody that could help them out. This is the era where there was like seven shows, you right? Know? It was it's like, like Jackie Gleason had one, and, and there's people Burl. setting up the sets and like moving things yeah. for the next one. The stuff was just still live. Yeah, like literally. It's like we just have the camera running. Like, right. just next. Like, yeah. <laughs> but he did work put, at put NBC. A, put a card in front of the camera so they can't tell. It's, that, I that think they ch- did sometimes. <laughs> we're just changing things. <laughs> uh, and in 1953, he moved back to Pittsburgh, uh, near his hometown, and he teamed up with a woman named Josie Carey, and they developed a program called The Children's Corner. Josephine. I don't know why, but you just look so regal today. Well, I try to keep myself in regal form, Josephine. Well, you do a very nice job of it, King Friday. Thank you so much, You're Josephine. Welcome. What a pleasant visit. So basically, Josie was the host. And Mr. Rogers did the puppeteering ah. and the music. So it was on this show, The Children's Corner out of Pittsburgh in the 50s, that a lot of the famous Land of Make-Believe characters were developed, such as Daniel Tiger, who mm-hmm. still endures to this day. Yeah, I know uh, your kid My likes kid Dan- was into him, yeah. Daniel Tiger, but the animated kind? He's, yeah, Daniel like Tiger's a, neighborhood. He's jumped into animation now. Yeah, he's very animated. Uh, King Friday the 13th, his wife, Queen Sarah, X now, see, the I Owl. I remember them. Yeah, of the, course. The King and Queen. They, yeah. they, they were like, ooh, ah, the King and Queen. X, Quinn, of course, the Owl, and Henrietta yes. the Pussycat. Uh-huh. Meow, meow. I know them. And Lady Elaine, who did the museum go around. She was kind of an ornery fella. I mean, lady, <laughs> is ornery she the, woman. Is that weird looking puppet? <laughs> like, that, it's like, with the red I thought nose. it was like a witch or something. <laughs> I, I couldn't. The hair is like just straw. And she's kind of <laughs> <laughs> straw. She's kind of crude, too, Lady yeah. Elaine. She's not always nice. Do you, do you think that that puppet is one of those that maybe they should have changed when they made it to prime time, but they're just look at they kind of like, eh, whatever. Like, you know, they, we like it. It's kind of raggedy, whatever. It's very raggedy. Like, it's, it looks like they threw, like, it's the same puppet throughout the whole time, and they just, like, th- it literally was, like, one of the first ones that they were like, we intend to make this better, but we just, it's just here it's like for, a, yeah. It's like a prototype, basically. Yeah. What do you want? I'd like to see you. Why? I don't know! Also on this show, this will be useful if you're in Canada, listen up, because you're going to know what I'm talking about, was Ernie Combs, who uh, was Mr. Dress Up, and I guess that's kind of the Canadian equivalent, so to speak, of Mr. Rogers. Mr. Dress Up. <laughs> Mr. Dress Up. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Bird. Thank you, boy. You're welcome. No, I thank think I'd better go in and take these things back to the tickle trunk. So for all you, so what does he do? wear different Halloween I costumes or something? I like, never watched the yeah. show. <laughs> but for all you Canucks out there, all of you uh, north of the border here, let us know your Mister Dress Up memories. Okay, is it was this after Mister Rogers? Like they're like, hey, that Mister Rogers, that's a good idea. Let's make a Canadian version. And then that's a good idea. Let's put maple leaves and yeah, stuff on it. <laughs> Drink syrup, obviously, yeah, yeah. of course, and has antlers. Mm-hmm. Canadian he's a content, yeah, yeah. CanCon. Yeah. Anyway, in 1963, the Canadian Broadcasting Corp, the CBC. They asked Mr. Rogers to host a 15-minute television program. Okay, so let's date this. 1963. TV is relatively new still. It's starting to mature. The 60s is where it starts to, they start figuring things out. It's not just needing a floor director to move sets around. It it does always fascinate me how, like, raggedy, like, early 50s television is. Like, it's, like, just, like, whatever. They were just figuring it out. Yeah. It's actually kind of charming. Yeah. Uh, So he did host a 15-minute program for the CBC known as 
Mr. Rogers, no space, just Mr. Rogers, you know, like one R. Though we ultimately know very little about the show, it can be inferred that it was very similar to the eventual hit PBS series. 1963 to 1967, this was the first time he was on camera as a host this time. Aha. Uh-huh. But he also worked with, again, CanCon, Ernie Coombs again. So they have an association. Combs or Coombs? Coombs, Combs, whatever. I don't, okay. I don't really care, to be honest. You guys up in Canada can correct he me. He didn't really make it into the American canon. No, he's CanCon canon all yeah. the way, the triple C. Stop. It's weird that Mr. Rogers has like a separate Canadian canon. Yeah, <laughs> Canadian counterpart. <laughs> yeah. So, meanwhile, during all of this, early children's programming, again, we're talking about the infancy of TV, one of the most notable early shows was Howdy Doody. Howdy Doody time. Howdy Doody time. Hey kids, what time is it? Howdy Doody This started 1947 here. Oh man, that's just US. like when the prototype TVs right. are like getting out there. They're really isn't that like Isn't that like the year they, I know that technically like the television was invented in, in 38 30s. or something, yeah, something like that. that, but they didn't really like, hit mass market until the late 40s and even then they were like super expensive yeah they didn't like, take off until the very early 50s right. i love lucy was one of the reasons and the post-war tech yeah post-war tech we've yeah. been talking about here created a little bit before the war but we don't have time for that right no, now like that kind of tech we like, have to make pennies out of steel right now right, let's, so let's wait till after 1945 and then we'll right. want, we'll start getting it out there let's cool our jets here yeah uh, so howdy doody which was on from 47 until 1960 if you've ever seen it, I'd be impressed. Uh, but it was a puppet, you know, a dummy mm-hmm. of Howdy Doody was. It was like a Western themed kids Which thing, you know, so ventriloquism. Everyone, what's with all the Westerns in the in the middle of the 20th century? Well, John Wayne was popular, and Roy Rogers. It almost feels like there was a. Um like we want to reminisce about the old west or something which yeah. in, in those times was only like 50 years ago yeah, it wasn't or that long ago 50 that, 60 years ago yeah. yeah but it's like the way you know we reminisce about things from the 70s 80s now yeah it's not that much different if i you mean really even think reminisce there's all sorts of documentaries about world war ii in that time yeah. like the time period that this is in they're right. reminiscing about it now see that was that would have been the retro pop culture podcast at the time right you would have been doing western let's themed, talk you about know? the civil war and like right let's talk about bonnie and clyde you ever hear the term the gay 90s that's what they refer to the 1890s yeah. Yeah, back then yeah. yeah let's talk about billy the kid yeah while we're at it right but anyway howdy doody was one and that's where the term peanut gallery was popularized i mean it didn't originate there but you know the peanut i don't want to hear any comments from the peanut gallery you ever hear that phrase wait that came from that show well it was popularized due to howdy doody it didn't interesting originate there huh uh, but again we're not talking much education just a way to entertain your kid yeah and i think this is what is the difference right i i think that and you can tell by things like Howdy Doody. It wasn't like Bozo the Clown, another one. Well, around that's this another time. one. Bozo 1949. So many special surprises. I know you're going to enjoy that. Quinn, you have a grudge against Bozo. It's because it was like they were still going with it in like the early 90s. <laughs> they, they were. Sometimes I go to my grandma's house and she turn it on. Like, I like, you know, like your grandparents, they don't know. Like, no. they don't know what kids are into. But, no. you know, this this is a children's program that was on even probably before actually during her time yeah and she's like ah, yeah sure that'll work right it's like all kids like clowns and there were a lot of bozos by the way yeah. and i'm not saying is that, that a chicago <laughs> only because it was on no. wgn when i was a kid so i was like is this a chicago only gimmick we had our own bozo there was a wpix bozo or wwor i can't remember okay. which all sorts of bozos various bozai yeah permeated the uh the local television but stations. getting back to this I, I think the the point remains here is that this early children's television was all about goofing around and yes. like it wasn't i think the thought had not come to anyone's head it's like why don't we make this educational Correct. like it was for adults it was entertainment so they figured for kids it's got to be entertainment right television, but, you kids mean. don't want to go to school on tv <laughs> you know what i mean like basically yeah no you're right uh, and then there was also Speaking in the same vein, there was Romper Room, which mm-hmm. debuted in 1953. What was this? Romper Room, by the way, was on until 94. Yeah, I've heard it's the insane. term Romper All these like early ones lasted way too long. Long time. Romper Room to this day is still used as like a term when like a place is a zoo. You know, it's yeah. a real romper room in there. Yeah, that's how I know the <laughs> right. term, but that, the, the show. I never watched it much. It was on during when we were growing up, but this was a show that was like 
it's basically like preschool or kindergarten on TV, meaning, hey, let's do a game. Let's sing a song. Let's have some storytelling. So we're getting a little educational yeah, here. Like yeah. we're, we're starting. It's more like in school. It's like you're watching kids at school. and then they, What if we put a camera in a preschool? Kind of. Like, I mean, honestly. <laughs> and then the most famous one out of this period, which started in 1955, and believe it or not, it's not Australian, Captain Kangaroo. Oh, good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome. Welcome to Captain Kangaroo's Treasure House. <gasps> My goodness, so we got a morning this morning. That's Bob Keyshawn. He was on until 1984. That's a long Jeez. run. Almost 30 years. Again, all of them long-ass runs. Long when did Howdy run. Doody end? Did uh, you, did 60, you say? 60. 60. Okay, so that's like the shortest one of yeah, them. Yeah, believe it or not. But Captain Kangaroo was a very kind of like free form structure, meaning it wasn't educational necessarily. It was more like, let's have some fun. Let's go on an adventure. Let's be silly. Yes. You know, it was one of those kids programming. And this is obviously not to mention all of the innumerable local programs per station in any given yeah, city and area. making up shit. Right. I mean, hoping it catches on and gets taken national. Right. But in 1968, with all this in mind, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, previously Canadian 15-minute show, 1968, to date that, okay? Tumultuous time in the United States, honestly. Absolutely. Really. It began airing nationally on NET, which was National Education Television. That channel, by the way, was replaced by PBS in 1970. Oh, what's the difference? Who watches PBS? <laughs> I'll tell you who. Discerning, cultured viewers like yourselves. So Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood began in earnest in 1968. For anyone that likes numbers, there were 895 total episodes of that program. Holy shit. Yes, it ran. I mean, that makes sense. He was on for like 30 years or something. He was on for a long time. It ran, uh, the initial run was until 76. He took, uh, not a lot of people know this, he took a three-year hiatus. Interesting. He came back in 79 and then ran all the way until 2001. First run. You think he was uh, the highest paid PBS? Uh... <laughs> I don't think he get paid a lot if you work on PBS, Quinn. He must have paid him something. He can't. He can't just like live out of a shack or something. I don't know. You see that yeah. set? He might have lived on that set. He might have. <laughs> Traffic light and everything. I, I did look like there. at home. It was. <laughs> I wonder if anything was up the steps. Well, that's one of the things I liked about the show is it opened with the little model, and then you'd hear the music. You know, Johnny Costa, the music director, would play all the. Songs and stuff throughout it. And anyway, you have the... Dee -dee 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 -dee. And then I, I was fascinated as a kid by the model. I yes. always wanted my and then own. They, they zoom in and then it slowly becomes like regular. Yeah. And then he walks through the door and he sings the song, you know. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Takes off his coat, puts on his sweater changes out of his work shoes and it was play shoes right that's what it is this this kind of already right that just that action i kind of like it because it it's kind of like your parents or something right they come home i know my parents they, they sure. change out of their work clothes and they yep. get ready to hang out with you or yeah. whatever right and it was like comforting for some reason there was something very grandfatherly about it you yeah know what i mean by the way if have you ever seen any of you out there, I'm asking a general question, and you, Quinn, the earlier ones from like the early 70s, because it was black and white for like the first year, and then it was color after that. So late 60s, early 70s, when he has like the black hair still, and he's yeah, like- Yeah, I've seen clips. He's like 40, and it's really- The first run where he's not weird. old yet. Yeah. You know, he's just still like, he's at the end of his 30s. He's yeah. start, just starting and hit the 40s, and there's not much gray yet. No, there's not much gray. I have two things today. This one is from Mr. Tro. And this one's from me. A new song. And it's just so weird because to me, I always associate Mr. Rogers as like a 60-year-old. Right. You know? That's I just, mean, that's just when we grew up. I'm sure there's got to be that era of people that associate him as a 50-year-old and then a 40-year-old, right. etc. It's like, that's too, he's too old to he's be too, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, that's a good point. To them. So, uh, but yeah, I think you're on to something there with just coming home, very casual opening. And that was his whole thing, right? He didn't like TV. That's, he said it in his own words. He hated it. So he wanted to find a way to use it because he recognized the technology. And if he, his goal was to reach children and teach children, yep. you know, look at this. Maybe we can broadcast a, a lesson out to them. Exactly. Because he did not like the types of shows, kind of some of the ones that we just mentioned, where you're talking down to the audience, you're yelling, you're, you're just making noise just for the sake of it. It's not even like you're talking down. You're treating them like they're stupid. 
there you go. You're just making noises and ha, ha. Right, yeah, like they're two or something. Yeah, like, like it's like what? What about the eight year olds? What about you know right. the, those kids? What? What are they? <laughs> you know, they're they're half a step away from just jingling keys of a television screen for right. a half hour. Exactly. You know what I mean? Just like get, with shiny <laughs> things, guys in costumes right. and stuff like something with a pie. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. Yeah. So Mr. Rogers had a totally different tag. It's a very low key, very mellow show. There's what, something mesmerizing. You right? think so? That was the thing that always got me as a kid. You would t- it would come on, and I, I wouldn't be like necessarily excited for Mister Rogers, right? But pretty soon, I'm I'm mesmerized by the shoes and the putting the outfit on, and then walks in, and all of a sudden, I'm watching a fucking documentary on making crayons, and he's <laughs> teaching me about that. And this happens to be a film about how crayons are made. You know, half an hour later, I'm just like, "Wow, what happened?" Like, I, you I know, really like, did like that. You know, it was just, it, it was just like how it would go on that show. He would just kind of ease you in, and again, you weren't excited or anything, but you know, there'd be puppets and clips and yeah, hey, sometimes he'd take you on a trip somewhere. Yeah, like we're gonna go to Chef Brockett's or whatever. And he you mix, know? and he mix in stuff like maybe something would maybe the puppets would be fighting and he'd be like, hey, that's not how you act, and you know. Yeah, well, he would recap the latest goings on in the land of make believe and right. be like, and X the owl isn't very happy right now with Henrietta, you know. Yeah. And then why don't we go? And then Trolley would take us there. And then, yeah, yeah. And then he would, and then he would kind of like teach us a lesson about like conflict resolution right. or something. And it was actually really good. When we start thinking about everything in the world, it's the people who are the most important part of all. You know, there are probably people, listen, I get being cynical, right? But you have to be having a really bad day to be cynical about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Yeah. I'm serious. There's nothing, like, overtly negative about the show. It never... Yes, he he would speak about... um, topics of the day like i know there's a clip in the 60s yeah where what was it like he shared a pool with a black person and it it was like it was a huge deal for racial integration right it was a massive deal it's so warm i was just uh putting some water on my feet oh it sure is would you like to join me it looks awfully enjoyable but i don't have a towel or anything oh you share mine okay sure and he just went for it man. he just went for it and he's like basically like there's nothing wrong with this see yeah no i i think you know maybe he had a reputation at the time because i wasn't an adult obviously in the 80s and 90s when i was watching this of being boring of being like an old fart or or whatever but honestly if you look back as an adult i really do see just a, a genuine person Yes. Not a saint, not someone that was perfect, you know, not someone whose every single belief was the the right thing. But I someone, never thought he acted like that. He no. never thought he was he never acted like Ever. he was high and mighty. No. We all make mistakes. Right. Like he would say stuff like that. But I really think that he's genuine. Right. I really really do. I don't think any of that was an act. To be fair though, he would be in his day considered liberal to the point of politicians brought him up to the stand to speak for what he was doing. Well, yeah, yeah you, you know, know, in 1969 he actually testified uh, for uh, for a grant, basically for money for uh, educational television in front of Democratic Senator John Pastor. And if you've ever seen that testimony. It's remarkable because he pleads his case and he gets the money. Right. Yeah. They end up paying because we, we failed to mention so far. I mean, public television it is fu- it's fucking public. It like it's funding. actually <laughs> funded by the partially funded by the government and viewers yeah. like you. <laughs> like, this program is made possible by annual financial support from viewers like you. It is. It is. Like, that's not like a lie. No. (laughs) Like, that's not just something they say. Like, you know what I mean? They have to, like, actually ask Congress to give them a little scratch to make these shows, right? And he got the scratch, man. Right. He almost brought uh, the the senator uh, from Rhode Island to tears. Uh, And I'll dump some of it in right now just so we can take a listen to it. I'm very much concerned, as I know you are, about what's being delivered to our children in this country. And I've worked in the field of child development for six years now, trying to understand the inner needs of children. And I feel that if we in public television can only make it clear that feelings are mentionable and manageable, we will have done a great service 
for mental health. Great. Well, I'm supposed to be a pretty tough guy, and this is the first time I've had goosebumps for the last two days. <laughs> well, I'm grateful, not only for your goosebumps, but for your interest in, in our kind of communication. Could I tell you the words of one of the songs which I feel is very important? Yes. This has to do with that good feeling of control, which I feel that the children need to know is there. And it starts out, what do you do with the mad that you feel? And that first line came straight from a child. I work with children do, doing puppets in, in very personal communication with small groups. What do you do with the mad that you feel? When you feel so mad, you could bite. When the whole wide world seems oh so wrong and nothing you do seems very right. What do you do? Do you punch a bag? Do you pound some clay or some dough? Do you round up friends for a game of tag or see how fast you go? It's great to be able to stop when you've planned a thing that's wrong and be able to do something else instead and think this song. I can stop when I want to, can stop when I wish, can stop, stop, stop any time. And what a good feeling to feel like this and know that the feeling is really mine. Know that there's something deep inside that helps us become what we can. For a girl can be someday a lady and a boy can be someday a man. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. <clears throat> Looks like you just earned the twenty million dollars. <laughs>
morals, like you said, right from wrong, reasoning, basically the why behind yeah. everything, not just A, B, C, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, there were episodes, I know this happened, like, where he would explain, like, divorce 100%. Kids, like, and stuff, like, real stuff. And like, speaking as both of us, as children of divorced parents, you yeah. and me, I mean, it is comforting to have that out there. Right. It's, <laughs> it's just out in the open on TV, and other kids can see it, too, so you're right. not, like, the weird one, right? Exactly, yeah. yes. And he would go over things like, one time his fish died on the show. Like, I don't think that was planned. I right. think his fish was dead when he went to feed the fish, so he dealt with it. Right. This is what happens when a pet dies. Sibling rivalry was covered. Anger was covered. Moving to a new school, like m- things that kids deal with but can't articulate. Right. The because fe- they're children. <laughs> yeah, right. The feelings that they have. He was very big on feelings. He And it wasn't just a catchphrase. He was really trying to help kids confront yeah, these things. It wasn't. I, there's probably a lot of people who haven't seen it because he's now been gone for 20 years. Yeah. But like if you were around back then, it really was like cathartic. It sounds sappy and stupid in the world we live in today. Right. But these were things that were people buttoned up back then. You didn't talk about. Yes, right, it, that's it, a great was, point. it was a public service almost to have a man like this that's going to talk to your kids about stuff like this that you might not even be comfortable talking to your yeah, kids about. Or right? that you might not even realize that you should be talking to exactly. them about at that yeah. time, you know? I plead for your protection and support of your young children. There is just so much that a very young child can take without it being overwhelming. Like you said, he didn't talk down. He was an authority figure. I mean, he was Mr. after all, yeah. but he didn't talk down. Yeah. He, he didn't treat kids like they were dumb. And he didn't... What was interesting about him is a lot of these other shows, it was like you, the viewer, were watching other people have fun. Right. On Mr. Rogers... You were part of the show. He talked directly to he's you. He's always talking right into the camera. He, you know, sometimes he turns away and he's doing something, and then he'll turn back and be like, "You see, this is this is how we handle this situation exactly. right here." Yes, and it's like I'm going to go do this now, and you see, it's like, right. and in the the I I always love the little details of Mister Rogers, like tying his shoes. Yeah. You know, was a thing. Like he he would. He, he would drill that down like he knew how to tie your shoes because you watched Mr. Rogers. Right. He'd be like, okay. So we, and he flipped know, the shoe we, to the other hand. We loop it around. And, <laughs> uh, you know, like, it's true. Yeah, it, it, it's just like practical shit, emotional shit. It was necessary I, yeah, for, in what, the time that it was being done. 100%. And everything about Mr. Rogers was just so simple but so elegant you know like we mm-hmm. said the set the music the land of make i like that there was the land of make-believe because it yeah because mr rogers is grounded and then you know if you're a kid that might it might, it might bore you to just be in mr rogers living room for yeah. for, <laughs> for 30 minutes right, right? Exactly, so it's yes. like so he you know he spent 10 minutes in the land of make-believe see what the hell's going on over there right. and the kids be like oh this is amazing like it's all bright and colorful and there's all these cool things yeah you never know what king friday is up to you know there's always some arc you know what yeah, I mean? There's, there's always, always some, some story. crap going on there. <laughs> Something going on in Westwood. There's a giant object. Like, there's a trolley that yeah. goes through the whole thing. There's a giant freaking castle. There's all these. There's a tree house. Some there's guy lives in a st- clock. Yeah, there's like all sorts of stuff there. There's also cornflake, especially with this factory. I mean, you never yeah. know. You never know what's going to happen. It's great. And then the, some of the make-believe people are arguing or they're, yep. they're, they're collecting something or yeah, whatever. <laughs> so they're putting on a play. Yeah. Like, there's always some. There's always a happening. There's always a project. Like, yeah. It's always real. But I like that it's delineated as, okay, Trolley's going to take us to the land of make-believe. This isn't real life, kids. You know? Yeah. There's like, a very, like, br- a break there. That's yes. The, that's the other thing. And you might think that's stupid, but for a child, you kind of, like, have to do that right because they they might think oh mr rogers lives in the land oh he can just go to the land of make believe that's real yeah right Right? it's like no he's he's very clear like this isn't real like this is this is for fun we're pretending we're pretending even sometimes he'd frame it that way let's make believe that x the owl you know like he would say that and it was just really cool so that's mr rogers neighborhood in a little bit of a nutshell 
And we're going to talk more about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and more about Fred Rogers, the man, in a little bit. But on the other side of this break, we want to run down a little bit of some of the other shows that began airing around the same time and later. Children's programming, that is. And we obviously want to hear from you. You can tweet at us at AWM Podcast on Twitter and join our Facebook discussion group. But we will be back here. For now, we're going to the land of make-believe. But more Acid Wash Memories is coming up right after this. It's you I like. It's not the things you wear It's not the way you do your hair But it's you I like The way you are right now The way down deep inside you Not the things that hide you Not your toys They're just beside you When we're born, we don't usually have any teeth But as we grow older, we begin to get them one at a time. Baby teeth, some people call them. And they're very special. They make biting toast or apples or other kinds of food really fun. What's more, they help us to talk and say what we want. As we get older, those small teeth come out one by one so that we can get bigger ones in their places. Well, whether we have baby teeth or bigger teeth, we all need to be careful not to eat too much candy. Because, you know, too many sweet things can sometimes make little holes in teeth. Another thing, every person needs to use a toothbrush to keep those teeth clean, to take good care of them. Learning to take care of our own teeth is an important thing about growing up. There's an attitude out there. There's some things going on. There's a lot of hopelessness. What do we need to do? Weighs heavy on all of us, doesn't it? Yeah. And there's no simple answer, of course. But if we could, through television programs, as well as every other imaginable program, let people know that each one of us is precious. Let everybody know that that we have value in this life. I just want to know if, do you ever just cut loose and lose control? Do you ever yell at your wife? (laughs) I I just can't picture you having a... Knock down drag out with your wife, you know? No. Well, I think maybe you sh- it would be good to talk with her about that, but it's true. I have a very modulated way of dealing with my feelings. I- I've always been that way. I was raised as an only child for 11 years until my sister was adopted. And uh, no, I-, I don't scream. But I think that if I did, somebody said to me, why don't you throw something on your program? And, you know, that would be more for them than for me. Yeah, because you don't feel the need to do that. No, I don't. And now we return to more Acid Washed Memories. And welcome back, neighbors, to Acid Wash Memories. This is episode number eight, and we're talking about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I'm Joe Morata. That is Michael Quinn. Hello. Hello there. Won't you be our neighbor, folks? We're so Welcome thank to you. the neighborhood. Welcome yeah. to the neighborhood. It's really, it is such a good feeling to have you with us here. Uh, we sure hope you like Acid Wash Memories. We have more episodes coming each and every Monday and a bunch that you can check out in the meantime while you wait. So that said, we were talking about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and how it differed from some of the programming that had preceded it. Yes. Such as Captain Kangaroo and mm-hmm. Romper Room and a lot of noise, a lot of bah, you know, yeah. like, hey, kids, yeah. <laughs> and all those things. But there was another show that debuted the year after Mr. Rogers went national on PBS or NET and PBS. And that one is still on to this day. And of course, we're talking about Sesame Street. Yes, yeah, Sesame Street. Ernie, Ernie, get in here. Oh, hi there, Bert. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, hi, how are you? Don't give me that. I'm mad, and I think you know why. This is a cognitive learning show. Yeah, this is more like, you know, ABCs, one, two, threes, and singing and dancing and making it fun, and yep. you know, like that kind of thing. And a very good show for its time. Excellent I don't know, show. I don't know about now. I haven't watched it in a very long time. So this is the Jim Henson show. It is. It's considered landmark. In a way, it ended up being bigger than Mr. Rogers. Oh, it did, yeah. Because Mr. Rogers is more subtle. Very it, subtle. But the one thing I will say is I feel like these two shows combined are like the PBS brand. Oh, what a package. Like, I they, mean, they seriously. Were like, yeah. people, I've heard this said on documentaries, but it's actually true. That pair was like the gold standard of children's television. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, you don't have to worry about putting your kids in front of 
those two programs absolutely back to back right those were my two favorites as a kid right yeah 100 percent. in fact they and because sesame street was an hour mr rogers was a half hour before i knew how to tell time my parents used those two shows as a gauge of time i would like you know oh we're leaving in two hours and i'd say how long is that they'd say two episodes of sesame street right okay you know? yeah for yeah. real i'm not making that up that's cool i could picture it that way right. you know but yeah sesame street was groundbreaking in its own way. I mean, Jim Henson obviously had already been doing the Muppets for his mm-hmm. own Muppetry, you know, mm-hmm. the Muppet show. But incorporating Kermit, for example, was a great bridge to this new like now, yes. Muppet so ensemble. So let's let's talk about this for a second. The incorporation was kind of it wasn't all the time. Like Kermit was kind of just there. He's a like, side character. Like he's just there occasionally <laughs> just to be like, Hey, this is the same thing. Yeah. But like, <laughs> like it's basically, that's like all it is. And he's usually like doing the news. Remember? Hi, ho, Kermit the frog here. Yeah, I'm doing yeah. the action news or whatever. It's the just thing in is, a right? weird segment. That's like, doesn't really have anything to do with Sesame <laughs> yeah. Street. He's only brief. Like it's not a lot. He's like a visitor. Right. On Sesame Street. <laughs> he is. Uh, hi, uh, this is uh, Kermit the Frog here of Sesame Street News, and today we're out on the street here, and we're going to find out what it is that makes the average man on the street angry. What was cool about it, though, is it mixed in live, uh, it was all live action besides the skits, but it was real people mm-hmm. and Muppets, and they just coexisted. Yes. Like it was normal. There's definitely a subtle tinge of diversity, right? The In the Muppets, oh, you yeah. know they're weird and you know regular people like it's kind of the mixture right like that's kind of what the message and everybody can be friends right exactly oscar the grouch was there i mean you had snuffle up i guess you had big bird Mm -hmm. luis you know and burt gordon yeah Yeah. like people mr hooper for a long time elmo elmo not a big Elmo fan. Well, Elmo, like, he got big later because... He got too big for his I'll red britches about, as to uh, what he did. You know what the funny thing about Elmo is? Nothing. Me? Nothing's funny about is Elmo. Is that when I was a kid, Elmo was just a guy on Sesame yeah, Street. Correct. And I had no issues with Elmo. I know. Because he was just there. It was just like, normal. It was just, like, part of the show, right? And then suddenly, like, some genius over at <laughs> Henson headquarters over there <laughs> decided we were going to push the shit out of Elmo. Too much of a and push. Like, like, and, like, give, his, give him his own show and whatever. Ever. It's bullshit, man. Yeah. It was that damn Tickle Me Elmo doll, I think, is what catapulted him over the moon. Do you think the Tickle Me Elmo doll, while we're talking about this, is like... No. Do you think that that's like an inadvertent success kind of situation? Like, they probably made it through like, oh, kids will like this, and then it just fucking like blew up, and then they were like, now we gotta make Elmo his own thing and all this. Maybe. Yeah, but maybe he does, there was-, it, there was some element of like, it felt accidental. I mean, maybe. I, yeah. really, I don't know, yeah. but maybe. Tickle Me Elmo is the hottest thing this Christmas. Sold out of stores everywhere. But is it all just marketing and media hype? Anyway, back to Sesame Street in general. It was a good show because it was educational. Right. The kids could learn uh, letters, numbers, words, feelings also, and thoughts. And I would say it was more veiled educational than, than Mr. Rogers was, would you say? Yes and no, because in, in a way, there were very overt skits about learning letters learning numbers and things like that. Right, but the draw is, look at all these colorful Muppets. Yeah, right? it was, it's it was like, under the guise of uh, an entertainment program. I mean, as a kid, I was like, Big Bird's amazing. He's like bigger than a house. Like, what is the, <laughs> bigger the giant a giant bird that's like taller than the, a freaking brownstone? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, uh, well, they did have a lot of brownstones in th- Sesame th- there's Street. There's a monster that lives in the trash can. Like, what is this place? <laughs> like, you couldn't keep your eyes off of it. There was also the Count. I mean, there was a lot of colorful characters. You're right. Yeah. Some of my favorite things about Sesame Street, though, were the in-betweens. Not the live actions, but yeah. some of the skits that they would run. My favorite is Grover with the waiter. Or, 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 with the gro- or was Grover was the waiter, and the guy with the blue head was the customer? Very good, then. One little hamburger right away. Uh, make it very rare. Uh, yes, sir. Sing bitty, Charlie. I get the ding-a-ling every time I come in here. I mean, there was always Bert and Ernie. They They're see, great. They, they seem to always have a sketch. Well, they're definitely based off the odd couple, obviously. Yeah, but what's funny is their names are based off uh, It's a Wonderful it's Life. It's a Wonderful Life. Like, it's just a weird, like, it's a weird thing that Henson took on that one. The first time I saw It's a Wonderful Life and I heard, you know, Bert, Ernie, I'm like, what the f-? No, it was the, yeah, and, the, you know? and then you realize it's like, no, this movie came out in the 40s. Jim Henson saw it and just remembered that, that duo. Seriously. Uh, but you're right, though. Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers were were basically a package. Yeah. They were the flagships, I think, and the faces of the PBS programming. Mm-hmm. So did they ever cross over? I feel like there was like one crossover ever. I don't right? remember it, but I, I wouldn't like be surprised was. if it happened. It was probably like in the 70s, though, you know? 
Who is it? It's Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, come in. Thank you, Big Bird. You came back. Yes, well, I wanted us to have a visit. We didn't get to know each other before. Another one that debuted on PBS, uh, 1983 and ran until 2006. A lot of people have fond memories of this one. Was Reading Rainbow. Hi there. Everybody's been telling me about an amazing store around here. They say there's nothing in the world like it. So I wanted to see for myself. I really like this show. So LeVar Burton, Jordy, Jordy. from from Star Trek. You wanted to be Jordy, yeah. You know what's funny? When, when the, that show came on, that was actually my first introduction to LeVar Burton because I wasn't old enough to see Roots. Same here, yeah. And yeah, I was too, Roots. and I was I was a little too young to like get Star Trek yet, which I would later get very deep into. But I was too young for that. Yep. So this this to me when you know when I saw Jordy for the first time on Star Trek, I'm like, wait, that's that's the guy from Reading Rainbow. Same here. Like, yeah, what, that's what how the I heck? Knew him. Like I knew him from that. Yeah. Now, Reading Rainbow was overtly a show about books, getting kids excited about books and reading, and they would. Take... I loved yeah. this show. Oh my god! Even I the song I loved. Adored this show. Absolutely. Like, okay, it starts with the the butter butterfly in the sky, yeah. like, and then it, and it's like very eighties. Like it it's, it's it's it firmly eighties. Like how it is, and it, it, all it really was. Like honestly, it was just a bunch of kids being like, "I read this book. It's called this, and <laughs> yeah. it was really good." And like, and then it's like da da da, and then it would go to some other kid, and like it was just like that was the show. Remember the da da da. In case you didn't know, jokes are a group of words that form a funny idea. <laughs> It's one of the first bumpers that I can remember. Dun, dun. <laughs> like, like I, 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 would, I would always get a, a smile on my face when I would hear it even back then. Yep, I remember it fondly. I think it's ingrained in my memory, the bumper. You yeah, know? the uh, bumper. But I think the, the rest of the program was mainly fo- what it focus on one or two titles. Yeah. Like books and kind of being like, hey, you should read this. It's really good. And it brought them to life. Yeah. That was what it did for Kay. It brought these books to life, you know, it brought them out of the page and onto the screen. And see... I always thought this was an admirable effort as a show in general because getting kids to read is tough. I don't even like to read as an adult, like regular books. I'll read tons of articles and bullshit You're on the an internet. article, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much a news article kind of person. Um, you heard it here first. So I guess it didn't stick with me. However, it's something that I almost wish still existed because reading is so important to comprehending and learning that oh, this yeah. show, it did such a good job at making it seem like an attractive thing to do. That's exactly what it did. I think it got a, a generation of kids excited to read. Right. You know, seriously. And that was a big push in the early 90s, especially. It was like, remember, there'd yeah. just be like reading drives and like, we're going to bring a bunch of books to school. Sure. And like, here's all these cool books you've never seen. We book don't clubs. have them at the library. Tell you what, though, my son's school still does a book fair every uh, a couple of times a year. It's so important. He loves it. Yeah, it's so important. He brings home the books. He's like, look what books I got. He right. loves it. And Reading Rainbow basically took that mentality and just put it right there on TV. They're like, here, you get excited. Book fairs reading. every day. There you basically. go, Quinn. That, yeah. that, that's probably the pitch. <laughs> that's a great pitch, though, yeah. the elevator pitch, yeah. Good show. Uh, we want to hear your memories of all these shows that we're talking about. And obviously, those of you in Canada, tell us about Mr. Dress Up, or those of you in Australia, tell us about... Uh, what do you even have down there? Mr. Mr. Kangaroo. Mr. Crocodile. No, because we have Captain Kangaroo. Right, we stole it, so they <laughs> we can't stole even have that. I don't know what they have in it. Mil- Mildred's Playhouse Maybe there's probably just like, some shit. Like, Tim the kangaroo. He's just like a different kangaroo. He's, he's more of a local. He's, in, he's not coming from going to the U.S. What do they have? Though? Tim's a native. Tea uh, time with Margaret? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway. Uh, do you remember Lamb Chop's play along? Yes, Lamb Chop. Thoughts? I'll be honest. I'm giving you like my child opinion. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Like, yeah. I thought it was for girls at first. Is it because it was Sherry Lewis? No, it was actually because Lamb Chop seemed like more feminine. Well, Lamb Chop's a girl. Right. I don't know why. It was like, yeah, it was like in this very like dainty place and, you know, well, Sherry Lewis. There's also Charlie Horse and Hush right. Puppy. Oh, we're having a picnic. You want to join us? I do. I'm starved. Oh, want some punch? You can't eat punch. I'm starving. I, I want something I can sink my teeth into like a 12-pound marshmallow. 
but what I was going to say is Charlie that Horse was an it's, asshole. it's another one of those that you'd be like, oh, I don't want to watch this if you're a little boy. And, and then it would slowly like lure you in because it was just it. like interesting. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was uh, one of those. I liked it. If you didn't watch it, folks, it was on from only 92 to 95. But a, a short run. Short run. But it was very popular. Very popular. Uh, Lamb Chop was not new. Uh, that was based on Sherry Lewis's character that she'd been. She was ventriloquist. Very good one, by the way. Mm-hmm. Excellent ventriloquist. A professional. Professional. She had had her own show, the Sherry Lewis show in the 60s. I don't know if it was called that, but she had her own show in the 60s and Lamb Chop was on that. So they just turned this whole thing into a kid show with, like I said, a couple of other puppets, Hush Puppy, Charlie Horse. And I liked it. The merch for this show. It was all over the place. Was it? I don't remember Oh that. my God. Really? Yeah. Remember they had to add Lamb Chop's underwear? It was Excuse real. me? Yeah, they had like everything Lamb Chop. Lamb like, Chop's you, underwear? Yeah, I remember there was an ad where they made a jingle for underwear with Lamb Chop's on it. But it was Lamb Chop's underwear for real? Yes, it was. It's real. Hey, it's Lamb Chop's underwear. One bad thing about that show is it was a... Uh... It introduced This Is the Song That Never Ends. Yes. That was, to me, actually the best part. To the it, best part? As a kid, I was- Oh, you were that kid? I was like, this is great. No, it isn't. <laughs> I would sing it forever to my mom, and she would get so mad. That's literally the worst thing you could do to a parent, yeah. speaking as one right now, if yeah. I had to endure that right now. And the worst part is she can't really say anything because it's like an educational show. There's nothing educational about that crap. Lamb Chop, though. That song, I mean. Yeah, no, that's not- <laughs> My mom would sing along with it, too. She thought it was fun. Well, again, it, yeah. it was a good... But then I would get, keep going. Because it doesn't end. Because I'm a kid, so I'm like, well, it, it says it's the... <laughs> you were that kid. Yeah, I like, can't believe so, you. So does it, does it end, Mom? <laughs> Horrible, Quinn. <laughs> yeah. You shouldn't do that to your parents. Here's one that I think has no educational value, and I think there's a lot of criticism of it for that very reason. I'm talking about Barney and Friends. He's big. He's purple. He's your best friend. He's Barney. Hey, everybody. What about it doesn't have educational value? Because to me, it was, I wasn't, I was a little too old when it came out. But of what I saw about it, it was kids in a classroom and Barney teaching them not to be jerks to each other. Like, wasn't that the, wasn't that basically the show? Wasn't it like a little bit of Mr. (sighs) Rogers mixed with a giant dinosaur? Barney pissed a lot of people off, let me put it that way, because I think because he just looked annoying and he sounded annoying. I think that's the most, the biggest part of it. It's almost like just bad character design, <laughs> yeah, literally. Like he's like annoying. ruining probably a generally positive message from what I saw. It's not that it's not a positive message. I think it's that they're, it's very empty. It's just like, hey, everyone's good. Or, that's my bullwinkle, but you know, it, I'm Barney. It's a classic case of like- Hey, like, Rocky. Sorry. <laughs> it's a classic case, if I had to like place it, of PBS trying to adapt some kind of combination between Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street into like a new generation, I right? Hated it. Yeah. But I mean, kids who you and me were too old for it, but I was sorry, right on the cusp, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So but the kids that grew up with it, Ugh. like they're at like to them that was a big part of the PBS lineup. I think people got pissed off because he would just like make up new words to establish songs you know like, i love you you love me like you know and just yeah. it was just annoying i think there was something very cloying about it very saccharine yeah you know it didn't have the sincerity or the warmth of a there mr actually, rogers there actually was a public backlash and that's kind of it, it ended there really was yeah i mean it was on for a long time i but think the public backlash was a little much i mean at the end of the day it's a fucking kid show who gives a shit like, well, I think yeah, because yeah. the fact that it was on PBS and some people felt like they could have an opinion and shut it down. Yeah, not only that, but I mean, it almost seemed like a merchandising grab because if you remember in the early it's 90s. It's one of the early ones. Yeah. I mean, Lamb Chop was it going in that direction too. It was. I, I told you about the underwear and the, <laughs> and the Lamb Chop doll. So. Yeah, but Lamb Chop didn't have the saccharine nature that Barney did. Barney, it seemed very much like, let's make a show that we can merchandise. It's like if, if Lamb Chop was kind of the prototype of like a short run, like Barney is like but the- Barney was on a long time. Yeah, Barney's the like, let's really hit it they hard did. with the merchandising. Barney wasn't popular for very long. It was on for 18 years. It there just, was a year or two where he was like the hottest everywhere. shit. Yeah, 93, like, something like, like that. People, there, there was some kind of Christmas gift doll of him. That I was think like, just the plush Barney was like very hard to find for a while. Right, yeah. Everybody's freaking kid wanted one. It's true. But I think it was just basically seen as like an insincere- 
attempt. I'm not saying that there wasn't yeah. positive messages and, uh, I mean, on it. These are the shows that went by the wayside, though. In in the end, they well, didn't last. They didn't have the lasting appeal of Sesame Street or Mr. Rogers. That's a great point. Like I mean, t- Mr. Rogers would have gone on forever if Mr. Rogers wasn't like 80 or whatever. Well, yeah, you know, he like was early 70s, and yeah. then he died. Yeah, but yeah, and then he. You know, it's interesting. If he would have gone on longer, he would have taken people through like 9-11 and, and war and stuff like that. And you like know he that. would have like addressed it. Yeah, he wouldn't have shied away from that. Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. He never did shy away from a social issue. He dealt with the, in the first Persian Gulf War, he dealt with it. Yeah. I think he did a primetime friggin' special on PBS for adults and children. Right. The least and the best we adults can do is to let our children know that we'll take good care of them, no matter what. People needed Mr. Rogers. And, and you know, going back to that, actually, like as we get to the later period here. Yes. One thing about Mr. Rogers is that because he had lasted so long, they could do something like that. Where like yep. he could speak about a, a serious topic that also applies to adults and adults would listen because, hey, that's. You know, he was essentially my teacher on TV yes, exactly. when I was a kid. I'm going to, you know, if he says it's, you know, what, if he says, that, you know, what's right and wrong here, I'm going to believe what he says, even yeah. as an adult. And it was always, you know, sometimes you'll see some of the things that he said in the 90s and even in 2000, 2001, sometimes during hard times in the world, videos of his will start to have a resurgence. Right. His comforting messages that he put out there mm-hmm. during that period of time. Because there is a long-lasting uh, impression that he left with people. His words of comfort, his words of, you know, listen, everything is going to be okay. You know, it's hard sometimes or whatever. You yeah. know, I don't want to even make fun of the guy or try to do an impression because he really was a, a really good man, I think. But I did want to address a few fun things here. On Saturday Night Live, <laughs> when Eddie Murphy yes. was a cast member. Now, Eddie Murphy, by the way, joined... During one of the worst periods for Saturday Night Live. I mean, it became the Eddie Murphy show because the show was so shit. It was, like, it was like, <laughs> they were just like, you know what? Just it's, do as much just, as you it's, can. It was like, I feel like the show is like 70% Eddie Murphy. It was him and like Piscopo. And, yeah. and obviously we know which one of those came out a little bit better in terms of career mm-hmm. for a while. But uh, Eddie Murphy in the early 80s had <laughs> Mr. Robinson's Neighborhood. Obviously, I'm going to dump some of it in. But it was it was a parody of Mr. Rogers done in like you know some dilapidated apartment that the guy would climb. The idea through. was it was Mr. Rogers in the hood, yes. right? Yes. Hello, boys and girls. I just came back from the grocery store. You know, a dollar doesn't buy what it used to anymore. That's why it pays to be a careful shopper nowadays. You know, ten years ago, this little bag of groceries would have cost five dollars, but today, forty six seventy nine. Wow, that's a lot of money, boys and girls. One thing about it, though, is Mr. Rogers met Eddie Murphy. Because <laughs> of course he did. And he loved it. Yeah. That's right. I just met him a little bit ago. Do you think we could see that? Well, certainly. Eddie Murphy? Mm-hmm. Uh, now, how do you react to that? Uh, we talked to, to Andy Rooney about someone doing an impression of him, and he didn't seem too keen on it. <laughs> well, some of them aren't very funny. But I think that uh, that a lot of them are done with uh, with real kindness in their hearts. Mm-hmm. Do you think that? Do you think that? <laughs> he did have a sense of humor about all. Yeah, this stuff. Yeah, I mean, like he was playing a character on television. At the end of the, he much, wasn't trying to be funny. On he was TV. very sincere and yes. like. You know, I'm sure he wrote those scripts and stuff. He did. He was involved like, in all of it. He also knew, like, clearly he, you know, he knew that that know, he the, would be fodder. He would be fodder for adults and or young, especially young adults. Yeah, just go with it. Like, with you know it. what I mean? Like, it, you're right. He had a sense of humor. He understood. He, he understood. understood what he was like. Exactly. And he, and he was like, <laughs> "That's funny," you know. Yeah, he didn't have a, a stick up his ass. Yeah, you know about this type of stuff. But uh, I remember growing up, and even into like my teens and stuff like that. There were always all these rumors about Mr. Rogers. I want to address some of these. Yeah, you ever what hear is some this? of these? There's I, I, rumors. There's always, there was always hush hush. Uh... Well, one of those rumors, folks, is that he was a, a sniper, you know, in either World War II yeah, or. Yeah, so that he was some badass right. in World War II or something. Or Vietnam, depending oh, yeah. on who's telling the story, even though he's too old for Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, and too young for World War II. Never mind that. Or that he was a Navy SEAL with 25 kills to his name, con- mm-hmm. confirmed. None of that is true. He went to... <laughs> Doesn't track with his life no. at all. He went to school. 
Then he became a minister. Yeah. <laughs> and he was doing children's None programming. None of this tracks with his actual biography. Zero. But but it's all it, it makes good cannon fodder because oh you could say it's like, oh, they you know, it's a secret. It's right. he's in the CIA or some shit, right? Well, and it's like during that period of time where there used to be those rumors like, Oh, did you know that Marilyn Manson is Paul from the Wonder Years? Yeah, I remember that one. Right. You had no internet yet. To, uh, like the internet existed, but you didn't even think to try to verify this shit on right. the internet. People just threw logic out the window. Oh, you know? Yeah, there was all sorts of stories. Like, never mind the fact that Marilyn Manson's real name is Brian Warner, I think it is. Yeah. And you could know that, you know? It's just, oh, he must be, because I heard of the... Did, did Kurt Loder ever get to ask Marilyn Manson if he was Paul from the Wonder Years, just, just to clarify? Like... <laughs> I feel like it was like a good question. Why specifically Kurt Loder? Because he was the interview music people guy back then. What about your cousin, Martha Quinn? She could have She wasn't to... on when Mar- Marilyn Manson yeah, was true. around. That's true. Uh, Kurt the... Loder was like with the network for, he might still be with the network for all I know. Isn't he like really old now, but it seems that he should 77. Be. He shouldn't be that old. You know I, mean, what I mean, you don't feel like Kurt Loder should be old. But then again, also, he was the old man at MTV. He in was the like the voice place. of authority, right? But like, when you say the old man at MTV, it means he's like 37. <laughs> like, 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 you know what I mean? Like, well, like Alan Hunter was a kid and Julie yeah, Brown. Yeah, everyone was a kid. And <laughs> Your Kurt cousin. was like, oh, he's, he's in his 30s. What an old man. By the way, if if you're joining us for the first time here, you didn't follow us from our old show, um, our Vantage Point Retro Slim Podcast. I'm not making a joke. Martha Quinn actually is Quinn's cousin. Yes. That's, this is this is a true just story. Need to make sure that I'm not just ribbing you. Yeah. It's actually true. But anywho, that was one of the rumors. Another one, this one is absurd, and it's very insulting in all seriousness, is that he was a convicted child molester. That's ridiculous, yeah. And because of that, there were never kids on the show. There were kids on the show. All the time. Yes. Not like every episode, but there were. You know yeah. what I mean? And then that's why the mailman or you know speedy delivery is named Mr. McFeely. <sighs> First of all, that's this shit is stupid. It's so stupid. That's that's his middle name, Fred McFeely Rogers. Oh, really? That's where that comes from? Yes, it's from his grandfather's last name or something. Oh, it's just so stupid. There, another one is that he had tattoos all over himself. Mm. That's why he always wore the long sleeves and the sweater. Never mind the fact that you can see him like swimming in episodes. No it's tattoos. not. He just puts his feet in a pool, but still, no, if, he no, was, no. if he was tatted up. There's like, ones of him swimming, I'm saying. Uh, just completely swimming. Okay. Like laps in yep. the pool. No shirt. Shirtless Fred Rogers. There you go. No tattoos. No tats. Right. And then there's another one. You've probably seen the screenshot. So many of you have. Is that he flipped off children? You ever see that yep. black and white screen cap? Yes, yes. Some you know, deep fake or something. No, it's actually real. But obviously the implication is, oh, he really didn't care about the kids, right? He's, right. It's in the middle of a song where you use your fingers to do something. Yeah. It's like he's like counting that. or something. Yes. Yeah. It's something like that. Tell me what you think, When Does this come from the fact that maybe if there's someone that seems so wholesome, mm-hmm. so pure, so genuine, that there must be some dark past? Yeah. Some, is that, where does that come from? Why does this happen? I, I always think it comes from things like... Um, televangelists in the 80s oh. and things like that. That's, oh. that's, that's always been my theory on why America's like that for anybody that's pastory and like nice and stuff. Pastory, yes. Because, yeah, you know, he has like a... That's that's he, he, more now. Yeah, he has like a pastor like... Pastoral. Qual- pastoral quality to him. I, I really think it comes from that. Like, you know, uh, what, what, what's the... Well, what, he was a minister. What's the lady and their husband they stole? Ta- Tammy, Tammy and Tammy, Jim Baker, yes. Tammy and Jim Baker. Like... <laughs> they're living like freaking kings and yeah. queens over Somewhere here, and then, yeah. and then they find out they're stealing all the shit. So do you think it just comes from the fact that if someone seems too good to be true, then mm-hmm. they must not be? Is right. it something like that? And because he was on TV. And because he's on TV. Does it, does it go back to the cynicism aspect of things? Yeah, absolutely. You think so? He can't be that perfect. Right, right. But, the, but when you explore the background... You understand why he's the way he is. He literally went to school to be a minister, yeah. and he kind of just fell into this, right. right? It's like he he is what he is, like, right. it, that, and that's it. And <laughs> I, it's very simple. Yeah, and he obviously had a big um, resurgence within the last five years. There was uh, the Tom Hanks movie, mm-hmm. but there was also, right around the same time, right, if I'm not mistaken, a very good documentary on him. Uh, which I saw. Did you see? I, I think I saw both of these things. Yeah, I didn't see the Tom Hanks movie. I, for, I don't. Tom Hanks portrayal didn't convince me for some reason in the trailers I saw. I just didn't. And I just wasn't interested in it. But I did see the documentary that came out. 
And it's interesting because his wife's still alive. Um, yeah, the documentary is the one I saw too. Yeah, and his wife is seems like such a sweet lady. And basically, in interviews that she's done, and then that said, you know, he wasn't perfect. He did yeah. have issues, you know, and he didn't view himself as perfect. He was hard on himself. Mm-hmm. He really strove to to really make a difference in the world. And I think his overall legacy really should just be that of, a, like I said at the outset of this, a, a kind, earnest, good-hearted person that was just dedicated to using this, yeah. at the time, new medium to actually help teach, comfort people. I mean, he comes from a different time. Like a time when you could look at television as not just a box for entertainment. Right. That it was a technology, like the internet or a computer or something. Right, that yeah. It was viewed that way and that people were doing all sorts of different stuff on it. I mean, even Jim Henson, who did, Ses- you know, who did Sesame Street, but he was even experimenting with teleplays. And there were a lot of those kind of artists playing around with TV and there was all people that had all sorts of ideas for it. Right. And this was just one of those things. What Mr. Rogers did was what if we could teach children through it, through it. Right. It was like, and it worked. It worked. And he was considered a pioneer for it. This is coming from a pastor. A pastor is a pie, a a technological educational pioneer. That's a good point. You know, and it's just the way the chips fell. Right. Because he just happened to live in a time with this new technology and he, Said, why don't I, you know, why don't I give it a shot? I, I, I'm working this job at this NBC place. Yeah, good. You know, point. Yeah, during the week. If it had like, been 30 years earlier, he would have been doing it on radio. Right. Exactly. I, I would think. Mm-hmm. And if it had been 30 years later, he probably would have been doing it on the internet. Right. Something like that. But I just think that. Um. Listen, I'm not by any means calling the guy perfect. I don't think anyone should. I just think that it's not worth having cynicism over. You know, someone like Mr. Rogers. I would hope that no one does because it's just stupid at this yeah. point, right? It's like <laughs> he's not around anymore, first of all. Yeah. And if he had been alive today, I'm sure he would still be trying to provide comfort and education to people. Right. You know, in all seriousness, mm-hmm. it just seemed like that was his life's work. You know what the funny thing is that a lot of people that had these sterling reputations in the in the last couple of years, there, there's been scant, they've been fraught with scandal and stuff like that. Yeah. Mr. Rogers has been dead for 20 years. You still have never heard a real negative no. story about the guy no. ever. <laughs> because I really think with him, what you saw was what you really got. Right. You know, I really think he was that. Re- Again, you're right that he was playing a character. You know, the children's yeah, television the host. a little different with his wife behind the <laughs> yeah. scenes and stuff. But for the most part, he just seemed to live his life in a decent and upright manner. Right. And not ever in a way that was condescending to people that had a different belief that came from a different background or Mm -hmm. anything like that. And that was one of the great things about Mr. Rogers is that he really did try to encourage each child that watched him to be the best them that they could be, Mm -hmm. you know, to be special, to be unique. Yes, you have anger. Yes, sometimes you're sad. Yes, sometimes life is hard. Sometimes you make a mistake. Yes, yeah, exactly. Sometimes you make a mistake and you don't know what to do. And that's okay, too. And that's the kind of comfort, that's the kind of uplifting acceptance, I think, that people still need to this day. Yeah, it's a shame there's not somebody like him. Because it really did probably shape a lot of people. And I think it had the potential to shape even more. It did. You know? It didn't shape everyone, obviously. No, but, it didn't. You know, and the longer it went on, the more the more people could have reached. But yeah. unfortunately, he is also a man, and he can't live forever. He's no. not the Highlander or something. Sadly, passed away February twenty seventh, two thousand three, mm-hmm. twenty years ago, uh, since the world lost Fred Rogers, a man who commanded respect and a man who uh, I think was respected by so many. So we're and a gonna- man that probably influenced PBS. From an educational perspective, that's also part of the legacy. Oh, probably. I think set a template that, you know, there's there's modern YouTube people like uh, Blippi is one of the kids stars. Don't look him up because he'll find a bad story from a while back. But other than that, what he portrays is very similar to Mr. Rogers. It's in a very excited, you know. I feel like he even set the tone for PBS in general. Like part of the reason I feel like Masterpiece Theater, for example, is on PBS is because of like it's it's like what the network is known for more like we're going to show you um, versions of classical novels and like, like just real 
educational, educational stuff, sure, right? Yeah. Period pieces period and, pieces. and historical stuff and that road show where the you know antique antiques, road show antiques. great program like it's all like because mr rogers came so early in the network's life he did in a weird way set the tone for what it was right what Good it point. and what it still is it's it's more of like the educational and you know history and literature and kids stuff stuff for that's good stuff for kids not sure. like junk quality programming and paid for by the community and like it it just has like a vibe documentaries like just anything that's that's informative not trashy like high quality that's a good point you not never... just not just like junk the history channel stuff like you know what i'm talking about like <laughs> i do you know like it's not about the sasquatch and if he's real Is even he though real? i'm pretty sure they had that anyone pbs know? did have the show with um leonard nimoy about like all that shit don't bring that show up yeah Please don't bring that show up. <laughs> I keep I thinking know. of no, it lately. I don't, don't want to talk about that show. Uh, but in all seriousness, folks, um, Mr. Rogers was uh, was our neighbor for so many years, for so many of us growing up. I just don't think there will ever be another Mr. Rogers. No, you? I, not, I just, not at all. Once in uh, a lifetime. A very unique person. Once a, one be of somebody a kind. like him, but not him. There will never be another Fred Rogers. Thankful that I got to watch him growing up. Uh, thankful that you can find a bunch of episodes of Mr. Rogers. If you ever just need a little bit of encouragement, if you ever need a, a little pick me up, basically folks, we're thankful that you're here. It is, like I said, such a good feeling yes. that you're here. We're thankful that you're our neighbors. We are. Uh, we encourage you maybe to think about Mr. Rogers for just a couple minutes. Even let us know your thoughts about him. Reminisce away on Twitter at AWM podcast or join our group. And uh, maybe look up a clip or two of Mr. Rogers. Yeah, you know. if you've never seen him before, man, there might be people. Yeah. It's possible now. You Canadians out there and yeah. you Aussies and uh, people over on the other side of the pond, go ahead and do that. But one way or another, just want to remind you that Quinn and I will be back next week for something completely Absolutely different. Absolutely different. Yeah. Very, very different. Until that time, Joe Morata, Michael Quinn, we will see you next week. See ya. Like what you heard? Be sure to leave a review and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We will see you next week. You know, it happens so often. I walk down the street and someone 20 or 30 or 40 years old will come up to me and say, you are Mr. Rogers, aren't you? And then they tell me about growing up with the neighborhood and how they're passing on to the children they know what they found to be important in our television work. Like expressing their feelings through music and art and dance and sports and drama and computers and writing and... and invariably we end our little time together with a hug. I'm just so proud of all of you who have grown up with us and I know how tough it is some days to look with hope and confidence on the months and years ahead. But I would like to tell you what I often told you when you were much younger. I like you just the way you are. And what's more, I'm so grateful to you for helping the children in your life to know that you'll do everything you can to keep them safe and to help them express their feelings in ways that will bring healing in many different neighborhoods. It's such a good feeling to know that we're lifelong friends.